Hi guys, I'm Shmi, hello and welcome back to the channel. Today we are going to take a complete tour of my car collection. All of the cars here at the Shmi Museum, plus the ones that are currently absent, to so go through all of the details. Now this is heavily inspired by the Stradman, Adam LZ and plenty of others who have taken the new year as an opportunity to explain everything. And of course, if you've been following for a while, you'll know the stories and the memories that each of these cars have. If you're new to the channel, welcome. We're going to go through it all from the car that I've owned the longest, the McLaren 675LT Spider, through to the most recent arrival, the Lotus Amira that came shortly after the Zenvo TSRS. We've got a fair few to go through, but I want to talk about things like how long I've owned them, how many miles they've done, what the costs have been like for maintenance along the way, all the way through to some of the standout memories with each and every one. All of the cars up on the Benpak Auto Stackers, we have more here at the Schmuseum Museum underneath the office build that's currently ongoing. And being a bit of a Lego fan, some of you will know this, I decided I needed something for my keys, so I actually custom made a storage rack for all of the car keys out of 2,000 Lego bricks. Anyway, we've got them all here, but let's get cracking. Let's get started with the very first and pull out the McLaren 675LT Spider. First up then, as I said, the car that I've owned for the longest, the 675 LT Spider, I actually bought back in July 2016, six and a half years ago. It's cost a fair bit since then in terms of the maintenance because I've driven it around 18,000 miles. Now, I know over six and a half years, that's only just shy of 3,000 miles a year. It's not a huge number, but when considering the entire collection, it does actually all add up to quite a lot. Now, this car followed for me previously owning a 12C, a 650S Spider, the 675LT Coupe. At the time they said the Spider of the LT was never going to come, but when it did, I replaced the Coupe with the Spider and went for this completely bespoke one-off paint color. We named it MSO Orion Purple, but when you look closely, you'll see the blue metallic flake, which is actually in the same color as my previous LT Coupe, the Cerulean Blue, which is the very same shade that I also have to have over on the McLaren Senna that we shall get to shortly. Now the LT is probably the best car that McLaren have ever made, the modern era McLaren of course excluding the F1 in that, in the sense that they had really dialed in and refined the P11 platform and they got to this and made an absolute cracker. So like I say, along the way, it's had an annual service. It's had a few warranty issues, especially with paint. It was away for an extended period during 2020, partly because everything was closed, but partly because of the difficulties to get it all absolutely perfectly. We've also had a fair few tires because it's done track days at the likes of Spa, Nürburgring and plenty more. It's been driven, it's been enjoyed. In fact, when it was brand new, in the first, I think, six weeks from delivery back in summer 16, I took it all around Germany, Nürburgring for a while, and then all the way to the likes of Slovenia, Croatia, Montenegro, Bosnia, the most exceptional tour ever, Fuel Faction Ana, that we did with a few of the cars that I owned. The silver wheels were a controversial choice back at the time. I added after that first tour, all of these silver pinstripes over the top of the Topaz PPF. Those were done with vinyl at Dub Customs to match with the wheels and also the silver or stone gray as it's called that I have on the bucket seats inside. Of course, being a convertible means the roof open experience. Plus you can also open up the tonneau cover if you want to have even further storage. And I have driven this car a thousand kilometers in a day more than once and used that storage space for all of the luggage that we had. Obviously you can't then fold down the hard top retractable roof, but hey, there are worse issues along the way. Also, the plate, this is probably the most, I think, iconic of the Shmi plates. 15, obviously Shmi 150. In this case, we've got the quote, life is measured in achievements, not in years alone, from one Mr. Bruce McLaren, founder of the company. So it's added up in terms of costs to a total of about £21,000 over that time, not including insurance, because insurance is hard to really explain. It's different for every individual person, but that's the annual servicing, the tyres that I've bought for it, the costs that might have come up along the way and the road tax that we have here in the UK as well, which on a car like this is roughly £500 a year. It's something like that. So it's not a horrific number 
for a car like this. Although, of course, insurance is another two or three thousand pounds a year on top of that. But it's the car that I've owned for the longest. I love taking it out. It is one of my favorite cars to drive every single time I go anywhere near it. It sounds amazing. It sounds raw. It sounds angry. It sounds loud. In fact, I think we should just give it a, a little start up up here on the auto stacker at the moment. Doors, all of the drama that you want from this kind of thing, the carbon fiber tub, the interior is so focused. It's just a lovely thing. So let's take a listen to this. You can't go wrong. You can't go wrong with that burble, that noise, that crackle. And when they redid this end to make it the long tail, the LT, this wing, the styling, it's so cool. Such a cool thing. Titanium exhaust tips. They go blue when you've been driving them a lot, so they go less blue when it's been parked up for a while. Now, I can't start everything because we don't want to gas ourselves out here in the garage. So let me just turn this off. But literally, just shy of 18,000 miles, 33 to go. The car I've owned the longest and a car I never see leaving from the collection. On to the car that I've owned for the second longest amount of time, the Aston Martin Vantage GT8. Now I apologize for any of the wind noise in the background. It is a very wintry day, which will explain why some of the cars are not as clean as I would perhaps like. I bought this in January, 2017, and it was the most fabulous opportunity with Aston Martin for the road to GT8 to go through the entire process of this car being assembled. I was in the paint shop when the body was painted cobalt blue. I was on the assembly line when the whole thing came together, the moments of marriage, and even when it reached the very end, I was lucky enough to press the key in to start it for the very first time at the end of the production line myself, which was an amazing opportunity, something I will never forget. The Vantage GT8, I really bought as a tribute to the car that's right above it. My first Schmimobile, the Aston Martin Vantage Roadster that we'll come to. It's one of 150 cars. You could have them either manual or with the Sport Shift, the automated manual gearbox. But I think about 140 something of the 150 cars are manual for good reason. You could opt to have the very aggressive carbon fiber front splitter and the massive wing at the rear. And it was a bold choice going for this color scheme, the blue complemented by the golf orange. But I've had again, so many memories with the car. It's driven 11,000 miles since, including a trip to Sardinia with Fuel Fraction Douay. I had it up in Scotland for a while when it was fairly new as well in 2017 and just enjoyed it to the max. It's not a car that I'm ever going to do huge numbers of miles with. That's not what it's for, but it's a car that every single time I take it out and it's just had its sixth year service. It's an unbelievable delight. The only thing that I've changed or modified, you could say with it, was the installation of a switch for the exhaust valve from CC Charger very simple little add-on in the fuse box at the back. You can either pull the fuse out on an Aston Vantage of this generation, super easy to have the exhaust out and full noise, or you can have a little remote control switch installed. But this is a ferociously aggressive startup. Everything about the car on paper makes no sense. The price tag relative to the weight and power, it's only 446 horsepower, which these days is not exactly a big number, especially for a 200,000 pound car, but when you pop the key in, you get this. And it all becomes very, very worthwhile. That raw burble, that noise, that feel, that sound of it. It's just mega, just absolutely mega as I sit in here had good times with this. The seats are really comfortable. There's a lot of luggage space. I'm going to turn that off because it's really very loud. There's a lot of luggage space. So I have taken it on a trip to Germany. Pretty much all of these cars have driven the Nürburgring at some point. I'm a firm believer that cars need to be driven. Obviously, you can't drive 20 something cars all the time. You can't have them permanently out doing something. But as often as I can, all of the cars do go for good runs. And like I say, this has been multiple times to the continent. It's done a few laps at the ring. Pretty much everything that could have been to the ring has. To touch on the plate here, this car actually had the inspection done by the then CEO, Andy Palmer. So I took a quote from Andy Palmer, road cars are our business, but racing is the beating heart of Aston Martin, because this was obviously the road version of the Vantage GT8 race car effectively. The Vantage GT8 race car that took part in the 24 hours of Le Mans, but also that's part of the World Endurance Championship. And in 2016, it was the victorious model 
in that year's championship in 2017 it won at Le Mans and in fact the winning car at Le Mans actually came back to Gaydon when I was there the Aston Martin HQ with this car so I got photos of this car right alongside the winner which is super cool not only that it also has a different plaque in the front all of these are actually numbered out of 150 if I just come through I'm probably going to find out it's on the other side right now yep I tell you what this is very much a strange problem to have but not remembering which side the bonnet release catches is on or on is actually a thing but if I pop this open they normally would have a plaque in the front that says which of the 150 cars they are this car has as you're about to see something a little bit different <laughs> as I <laughs> contortion my body to try and get out of there pop it up I'm going to catch right in the center we have the final inspection by Dr. Andy Palmer, CEO of Aston Martin, because those were effectively the plaques that Andy Palmer used when he did the inspection of the first 1000 DB11s, which is when this car went through. Now that engine is glorious, but it definitely needs a cleanup. The 4.7 liter NAV8 that you have mounted up there, it looks lovely, but yeah, that needs a clean for sure. That's something to get working on in future. So the costs, oh, I have to drop that down. To make sure it latches the costs over those six years it's not that big a number it's about ten thousand pounds for tires for servicing i say tires it needs new tires because they're old they're at the end of their life but for all of the servicing and maintenance and the road tax again about 500 pounds a year for road tax and the servicing comes in at around a thousand pounds a year something like that 800 900 one or two of them have been a little over when it needs to have brake fluids and that kind of thing done. But again, a very special car with a lot of sentimental value. There's a funny story behind the next car, the Ford Focus RS Heritage Edition. This actually arrived originally at the same time as my red edition that I have now sold, which was a bit of a project car, which had followed the blue Focus RS, the Mark III that I had had before. But this arrived in May 2018, but I didn't go and register it until September because I was very keen to have it on a 68 plate. Now, UK plates are very complicated, but effectively, if you want a 68, it needs to be after the 1st of September 2018. So that was the only option with that. And the reason I wanted that is that they made 50 of these as a 50 year tribute to the 1968 Escort Mark I, effectively the spiritual ancestor of this car. And given my Ford GT and GT500 number plates, I was very keen to have this on the 68. So they made 50 of them in this teeth orange. You could only have this color on the heritage cars. They came from factory with Mountain upgrades. So you get a whole host of orange components in the engine bay, which are really very, very nice. This car's driven about 7,000 miles so far in the time that I've owned it, four and a half years. And I'll pop this open to come and show you very quickly. You get all of the other Focus RS niceties, the Shell Recaro bucket seats on the inside. You get the six speed manual and in here as i said you get the mounting intake with the orange components and it makes 25 horsepower more than standard 375 in total and it's a car that is incredibly desirable very much collector car but i've had fun with it i've driven it in the snow had some fun out and about with it a few small changes on mine one of those is to have got a second set of calipers which are painted in the same orange i actually have the original calipers separately those cost about a thousand pounds and we did a satin black roof at dove customs because i feel it makes the car look a little bit lower and a little bit sportier and slightly differentiates this one from others but other than that i think i've spent a total of just under three thousand pounds on the annual servicing and the road tax so not really that much to talk about it's not particularly expensive to insure somewhere around a thousand pounds so half of the GT8 or the 675 LT. And with all of the memories that I had with my blue RS that drove in the region of 14,000 miles, I want to say, the red RS that did again about 8,000 and this with 7,000. It's a lot of miles with the fast Ford hatchbacks and it fits very nicely in the Ford part of my collection. We move on to the first of the big ones, which actually arrived only a single day before our next entry. But of course, one of the most iconic of all of the Shimimobiles, the 2018 
Ford GT. And I actually went to the original unveiling and presentation of this car in January 2015 at the Detroit Auto Show. Crazy to think that was eight years ago. It wowed us all back then and it still looks stunning to this day. It's a car with a reason, with a purpose. There was so much demand for these things. Allocations were so hard to get a hold of. The competition around it was quite frankly ridiculous. And there was a lot of talk, of course, back then about the two year no sale contract. Everybody knows the story of John Cena's car, for example. But here we are, four years further on, my car that was delivered in December 2018 that has now driven 8,000 miles. And I know 8,000 miles on its own doesn't sound like a huge number, but when you consider that this car has been to the Nürburgring, to Sardinia, it's been to New York, Miami, Las Vegas, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Detroit, Chicago. It's done a lot in those 8,000 miles. And it's a car that has an immensely cool, if you ask me, story behind it. Both the fact of why Ford introduced it, which was all about going back to Le Mans, and that's why the plate on the car has the 66, which is the link back to the 1966 victory when Ford won at the 24 Hours of Le Mans, hence the quote as well. If I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses from one Mr. Henry Ford. They won four years on the trot, came back 50 years later with the new GT and won in their class, the GTE Pro class as well. I was at that race with Ford. It was an unbelievable day to be there. Of course, at that time, I didn't know I was gonna be lucky enough to secure an allocation for it. Now, my car was actually the very last of the 2018 cars here in Europe. There have effectively been two batches. The first was in 2018, where there were 80 cars. This was number 80 of 80, if you will. And then there have been newer cars in 2021 and 22, which have a few changes, OPFs, which make the exhaust a little bit different, more coolers, which help as well. But this is a car that has so many unique touches it's unreal. And if I can say so myself, I think it's a really cool story. So I should mention that the Focus RS heritage links to the 1968 Escort Mark I, and that connects to this as well. Because back in that year, it was a car wearing the red and gold of Alan Mann Racing, a British racing outfit that was victorious in the Touring Car Championship. So that was a pretty good reason for me to head in this direction. Alan Mann Racing cars were raced by the likes of Jackie Ickes, Jackie Stewart, Bruce McLaren, in fact, himself as well. So I was very keen on that theme and I actually reached out to Henry and Tom Mann, the sons of late Alan Mann, to ask if they were doing this because if they weren't I would consider it. And they've actually now introduced an actual official heritage edition. But for this car, which I think was the very first factory new GT to be painted with bespoke stripes instead of the standard seven or eight colours that you could choose from, I went to them and asked them if I could borrow a pot of paint that they actually used for the gold to go against the modern liquid red that we have. And that's how we put all of that together. But it's not only that, there are so many other details about it that just make this really and truly special beyond the engineering, the floating buttresses, the new 3.5 litre twin turbo V6. That was a big talking point on its own. There are about, I think, 1,300 of them or so in total in the world. If you come and have a look at the interior of it too, we did even more bespoke touches and elements in here that make this a truly one-off car. In fact, we went back to Sparco, who do the OEM interiors for the seats to give it this red and gold stitching that you can see all throughout and up on the headrests. Also, we have the gold GT embroidery. On the steering wheel and the shift paddles, I went to ADP again, who make the OEM parts to do the gold shift paddles and the cross stitch as well, effectively creating a bespoke heritage edition, which was all done with Ford's blessing and hasn't really been done since. Making this kind of one-off in so many different ways. Not only that, we've got the BBS FIR wheels, which are effectively the GTLM race car wheels. They only made 10 sets of them again on this. So once you combine all of these personal things like taking it across the world to the USA and all around Europe, the story behind the whole spec and how it ties to my Ford collection, you start to see why this for me is like the ultimate car, the ultimate Schmeemobile. It would be near on impossible with the story through all of the videos to ever let this thing go. I have neglected to mention that over those four years, I have so far spent about 16,000 pounds on servicing some tires, and that doesn't include the exhaust that I bought in the US, the Akrapovich exhaust, and that's been a whole confusing thing itself with having to change the exhaust a few times. But for a car of this value, that's not too bad going. Obviously, the warranty has now expired. There is no extended warranty that you can get on the car. It did pass through its fourth year service with flying colors, so I'm very happy about that. But I'm conscious also that it will be an expensive car to run down the line as 
Will our next entry to this, the McLaren Senna. The Senna arrived the day after the Ford GT. No joke. For me, it was pack that up at home and get ready to go to the MTC to unwrap this. Christmas 2018, again, four years ago. I've not done a whole lot of miles with the Senna. The total is just shy of 4,000 miles. Now, that's due to two things, really. The first is, as I'm sure you know, I did have a cosmetic incident for which I do have all of the parts when it was about six months old, and that took it off the road for about six months as well, which was obviously very frustrating. Thankfully, it was just damage to some body panels, the door, the wing, um, the spoiler, as opposed to anything underneath, which would have been a much, much bigger problem, but effectively in a traffic jam at about 15 miles an hour. Unfortunately, I got clipped by a truck that was pulling into my lane behind me, and that's been a whole story, obviously, many of you will have seen. Since then, this year, when I did have some plans to drive it some more, I encouraged the, or encountered, I should say, the frustration of needing to wait for parts that were on back order for a very long time. It took about eight months, maybe, to get two new dampers, which were fiendishly expensive, although thanks to McLaren, they did cover towards those with some goodwill, as it happened eight miles after the car had gone out of warranty at the start of the year, which was very, very frustrating. So the problem almost certainly was there beforehand. Now, aside from that, it's been through all of the services as you would expect. It costs around 2,000 pounds a year, and I've had some extra tires as well. So we're about 10,000 pounds into this in total through that time. Not too bad, quite a lot obviously for the mileage. I expect it's going to get more expensive as it gets older. I expect more things that are gonna go wrong are going to be very, 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 very expensive. Now, the car itself is in MSO Cerulean Blue, as I mentioned earlier, the 675 LT Coupe color, a color that has really been a mainstay of the Schmeon 50 channel. It's always had light blue logos, sometimes swapping back and forth, I should say, with purple, but I went with the dual tone with the exposed satin carbon fiber to contrast. I've always been very happy with the spec of this car. And obviously it's a car that, again, connects to motorsport. That's a big theme you see here, in particular, named after one of the greatest, if not the greatest F1 driver, driver full stop of all time, Ayrton Senna. In fact, that is why we have the 12, because in his Formula One championship years, in fact, the year he won the world championship for the first time, he had 12 as his racing number. And then obviously back then you would change to the number one thereafter. But I have no idols. I admire work, dedication and competence. Ayrton Senna, I thought that was a fitting tribute to have that, given we have the Bruce McLaren quote over on the 675 LT. Now with this, I've driven it at spa francorchamps I've driven it around the Nürburgring Nordschleife. In fact, it was the first McLaren Senna to ever go around the Nürburgring Nordschleife because at that point, McLaren hadn't even taken one themselves and no other customers had driven it either. And I can tell you, it's very, 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 very fast. It is terrifyingly fast. It makes other very fast cars like GT Black Series and GT2 RSs seem not so fast. They've never set a lap. I'm very confident if they did, it would be up there with the AMG one if, who knows, not even perhaps a tiny bit quicker. It's a car that has a full carbon body construction, 800 horsepower from the four liter twin turbo V8. They've made um, 500 of them plus 75 or so Senna GTRs, plus a few others like the Senna LMs, the Senna Can-Ams, 20 LMs, I think three Can-Ams, and a couple of other derivatives. But it's scientifically beautiful, we can say. The design is not pretty. Nobody's gonna look at this and say it's pretty, but all of these gurneys, the nose bridge, are all here for a reason. The nose bridge is about keeping clean air to go over to the snorkel. The gurneys that you have down at the front as well here are about lifting the air so it can accelerate the air out from the radiators that you have behind. Every single element of this has a reason. Active aero happening everywhere. The number plate plinth is removable. It is screwed in, but it's magnetic, so you can take it off if you get to the racetrack and you need the extra cooling at the front. Same actually with the rear. So many details about it which are completely honed in for maximum attack, maximum track performance. And in fact, I want to pop open the doors. Let me let you head around so I can show you inside just for a moment because it's super stripped out inside here. We kept this very simple with the spec, the black Alcantara finished with some light blue touches. For example, the stitching on the seat pads and probably my favorite highlight is on the doors where you have the gas struts in the matching paint color. To the exterior as well but it's all carbon it's all lightweight it's all driver focused the switch is up on the roof and it's an absolute event to drive 
every single time I've got into this car and gone out with it has been an experience. And it's not a car to take on road trips. I've transported it around quite a lot. I've transported it across Europe, in fact, behind my G-Wagon in a trailer. It's been to many different places because it's actually not that fun to drive on the road. It's so noisy and aggressive. The setup and the camber is set up so much that you need to be gripping the steering wheel the whole time to drive straight, even though at 200 miles an hour, my word, this thing is epic. For the European cars, you have the triple exhaust. This is often a topic of discussion. The American or other market regions have a twin exit because of our extra regulations and having to be a little bit quieter. But basically, these two pipes are made from titanium and this one's made from Inconel which is quite cool. Inconel is like the ultimate exhaust material. Again, back here, all of these openings, this ridiculous wing with the swan neck mounts, dual layered. It's all just crazy. When you look at it and start to take in all of the details, it's kind of an otherworldly type thing, which like I say, is a car to drive when you really want to drive. And my word, when you do it, like lap times at Spa, I've been able to drive lap times that make me go, what? Like 2.30 or less at Spa in this which is unbelievable. And I know that I could also do a BTG at the ring in sub seven, which is, I, I, it shouldn't be possible. The car makes it very easy to drive that fast. It tends towards a little bit of understeer, but that's part and parcel of making it such an unbelievable experience. So the Senna and the GT was probably the wildest week of my life when they both arrived at the same time. Um, and thankfully to date, they've not been too expensive to keep running other than insurance, insurance for these two has been big money. I think between them probably averaging 10,000 pounds a year each, which is not fun when you think about how much that means I've spent on those two over the last four years. But hey, smiles per mile value is very high. We've got ourselves a troublesome one up next, but by no means does that mean I do not absolutely love this car. The Mercedes-Benz SLS AMG Black Series, the sixth car on our list. It's hard to believe that this falls in the first third of all of the cars we're going through because I bought it in February 2020. Now you can probably remember the state of the world in February 2020 and the unknowns that were going to be right ahead of us. In fact, I didn't actually upload the videos immediately. I saved them until March when the channel reached 2 million subscribers, which was a super cool thing because this had always been for me a dream car. When I first drove an SLS Black Series, and I can remember the day like it was yesterday, I knew that one day, somehow, that had to happen, and the prices were well out of my reach at the time. I was lucky when this particular car came along, a car that I had filmed myself six years prior when I had been visiting a dealership near Stuttgart. So when I saw it available from Schalkalissa in Munich, it was kind of we gotta do this, we gotta make it happen. We've gotta somehow add this car and it's been on quite the journey since. So it's three years old now, or it's about to be three years old in my ownership. In that time, I have driven it 16 and a half thousand miles. That is more than pretty much any other SLS Black Series has done in that amount of time. That's not a normal thing, partly because I was in Germany with the car and travel restrictions and all of that, so I just drove it everywhere rather than flying and because I was based in one place for such a long time, but also because of everything we had done with it. You'll probably remember that it didn't start this colour. Obviously, I had imported the left-hand drive German car, it had had two owners and only done about six and a half thousand miles up to that point. Imported it in the Himalaya Grey, which was a lovely colour, and I know this was very controversial. I changed it to the Mystic Blue, and I love this colour, especially with the silver wheels to contrast against it. I think it is gorgeous. It's a stunning car to begin with. The gullwing doors, the length of the bonnet, the shape, the width of it, and to finish it off and make it a bit of a one of one was kind of the icing on the cake. We then went to Opus in Germany and did the Rentec R1 upgrade package. We've been through a whole story with that along the way and different things and what's happened with it. And as well as a bit of bad luck, in terms of the electronic system, but also in terms of the engine and the power. I've had to spend quite a lot of money on this one. When I say it's been fairly troublesome, in three years, I've spent over 20,000 pounds on maintenance, including a number of heavy bits of work with avant-garde. Finding parts has been a bit of a nightmare as well. But then of course, on top of that, the regular servicing and maintenance. And I've done a lot of miles. If I hadn't driven it at all, I wouldn't have had any bills, anything like that. This is the price of getting out there with it and enjoying it. And I'm lucky that since I bought the car, it's probably doubled in value from what I paid to what it's worth now, which is obviously a glorious position to be in. You'll notice a few of my cars are left-hand drive. 
because of how much I drive around the continent and drive in different places, I have no objection to having the steering wheel on the left. And I actually bought this car, you'll find this funny, in February 2020, with the intention of taking it to the Gumball 3000 that was due to be three months later from Toronto to Havana at the time. Obviously that didn't happen and the car has never been out of the continent, but it has spent a lot of time bombing all the way around Europe. And obviously one of the biggest things about it is the sound that it makes once you've done this. It's so cool, it never gets boring. You can drive it sitting on the sill, but just take a listen to this, cold start. It's unreal, it's absolutely unreal. Cracking away, bubbling away. I can't get my head over that sound. If you're a petrol head, that's perfection. That's absolute perfection. It's also been to Cambridge Car Audio to have the sound system installation and upgrade because this car didn't have the factory B&O, which you can't retrofit. It was a 10,000 pound option at the time. You couldn't retrofit it. The cars were actually about 250,000 pounds base price when they were brand new. And now, like I say, now it would be worth triple that. Um, maybe not my particular car triple that, but a low mileage example would be. For me, low mileage is pointless. These are cars that are built to be driven. Like I say, this car, when it was finished and then got full PPF at Topaz, it was pretty much straight on to the Nürburgring to go and do a whole load of laps, chasing different cars, having fun out there, driving it as intended. And one funny quirk I established about this is when you drive around the carousel, which are the very tight banked corner with all of the concrete slabs, you're turning around to the left, which obviously puts a lot of weight from the front of the car out to the front right and presses this corner down into the ground. And underneath where you have this plastic piece, what I was finding would happen is every single time I would do a lap, I would crack that off which thankfully is not an expensive part. It's about 20 pounds or something, but quite funny because I could always tell when I'd driven the car at the ring because that would always be broken. And yes, you could just go around the outside, but where's the fun in that? Just do it, embrace it. It's less than driving a couple more miles in petrol. So at the end of the day, no particularly big deal. So it's a very special car. It's always one of my dream cars. And I think it's again, a car that will be with me forever. All of those upgrades, modifications, stories everywhere I've been with it, 200 miles an hour on the Autobahn, this is a bit of a recurring theme, driving fast on the Autobahn and driving at the Nürburgring and just being part of the whole Black Series story that expands from this into the others that we're gonna to get to shortly as well. Before the next car, very quickly here, the plate, 62, stands for the 6.2 liter NAV8 with the quote from Gottlieb Daimler, the best or nothing as I often have on the Mercedes, but it links very nicely to the plates that I have on the other Mercedes, 60, 61, 62, 63, and so forth. But next on our list, number seven, again, hard to believe that there have been so many new arrivals since, but we're back in the Ford corner with the Ford Mustang Shelby GT500. A car that I had been lusting after ever since it was introduced, having of course the Focus RS and the Ford GT, and this whole one company making a really cool hot hatch supercar and American muscle car. Now this in some ways wasn't as planned as it turned out because of the global travel restrictions. I was out of the UK, I went to the US, then lockdown started, I stayed there, decided, hey, I've got a visa to be here, I might as well make the most of it. Bought one of these in Florida, thankfully managed to pick this car up at about MSRP, when most of the time were trading for 10 or 20,000 dollars over. The car had delivery mileage. It's a carbon fiber track pack with the carbon fiber wheels and the carbon spoiler in grab a lime because I really wanted something that was bright and bold. We did the PPF, added the gloss black PPF Suntech stripes, also did the red vinyl to link in with the brake calipers and give it this overall look. But it spent the first year and a half of its life over in the US where I drove it about 12 and a half thousand miles in total. Thankfully costs have been fairly minimal because it only needs an oil change service for a couple hundred bucks and a lot of rear tires, a lot of rear tires, especially with the rallies and fun that I've had with it along the way. So I think I've spent just shy of 3,000 pounds or so over two years on the maintenance of the GT500, not including obviously the whole import process because I had paid sales tax for it in Florida, don't really get any of that back, ship it over anyway, pay all of the import transportation, all of the registration stuff with My Car Imports, who had actually also imported the SLS Black Series for me as well prior to that. And then obviously had to pay the UK VAT and duties and another 32% on top of the price of the car as well. Good times, not exactly, but anyway, 
12 and a half thousand miles, 12 and a half thousand very happy miles, two massive road trips. I did a drive in early 2021, a week or two after taking delivery, all the way 6,000 miles with a nice zigzag from Miami to Los Angeles. And then in the summer of 2022, did Gumbo 3000 from Toronto to Miami, having started in New York and done a whole loop with the whole story behind the carbon fiber wheels, which was a lot of drama as you might remember but it's a beast it's an absolute beast the gearbox in this thing is magical the gt350r has the manual box this obviously has the seven speed dual clutch it's very like a pdk box it blips between shifts like you would not believe and the sound of it which of course you can do because you can start it from the key being an american car it's lovely slightly slower start there that deep noisy grumble is not a very European sound. You can pop it up into track mode, make it sound even louder. It's a silly car. The track pack removes the rear seats as well. Let me just stop it for the moment, which is completely pointless in a big heavy Mustang. I've often joked, and I apologize if this upsets anybody, that what you're buying here is an entry Mustang, an EcoBoost, where you're probably spending $20,000, $30,000 on that. You're spending about $30,000 on your carbon fiber wheels, $10,000 on your carbon fiber wing, and a whole lot of money on the engine. This engine is a masterpiece. Lurking beneath these slatted vents, you've got the pulls to open it. It's such a cool thing. It's such a beast of a car. Now, as we've mentioned with the plates, we had 66 on the Ford GT, we have 68 on the Heritage RS. Bit of a no-brainer then to have 67 on the GT500, which actually is because the first GT500 was launched back in 1967. What a decade for Ford. But there's never enough horsepower, just not enough traction. A quote from one Mr. Carroll Shelby. To be honest, owning a Shelby Mustang, especially here in the UK, is really cool because they're not on sale. This is not homologated to be sold as a new car here. You can import it privately. But this is genuinely a rarer car here than either the Ford GT or the Senna. Some perspective for you. That's how cool it is. And the color is perfect. I actually started originally looking for a Twister orange one because I thought having the two orange Fords with the red would look kind of cool. But I'm very glad I went for this because it stood out so well. It's been such a wonderful thing and I can't wait to get it on a road trip to Europe. It's only obviously recently arrived here a couple of months ago, but as soon as the weather's better and the Nurbo rings open, I think you know where we're going. We're gonna move on to one of the two vehicles that are not here at the moment, the AMG GT Black Series, a car that I've done a lot of miles with in recent times. I took delivery in July 2021, following on from owning an AMG GTR, the original Beast of the Green Hell, the GTR Pro, the GTR Roadster, and of course, having bought the SLS Black Series, the GT Black Series, I again did the unthinkable and resprayed it. I bought a car in satin black, effectively graphite gray Magno, knowing that this was the intention to paint it in solar beam. Now at the time, and still the case for a UK right-hand drive car, you can't order a bespoke paint color from the AMG Performance Studio. So the only way for me to have a solar beam one was to buy a car and then paint it. So I literally did that in week one of ownership, which I know was a controversial point. We then went to Opus to do the upgrades, took it up to about 850 horsepower. And since then in only, well, since it was painted and all of the upgrades were done in only a little over a year of owning it. And the fact that in that time it's been to the Middle East and the US, I've driven about 13,000 miles in the thing, which is crazy. And many more are to come as well, but it's a car that's perfect for that purpose. It is a perfect GT car in the sense of having enough luggage space. I find the bucket seats really comfortable, but also you turn up to a racetrack as it has done, like the Nürburgring or Yas Marina or Circuit of the Americas, and you have the most epic of times with it as well. So it's a car that for me does everything. And that's why I took it out to Dubai and Abu Dhabi. That's why I've taken it all the way across the US in one direction from New York across to California and why we're going from California back to Florida as well and doing plenty more with it. Of course, I haven't owned it for long enough to have really accumulated many things by way of costs. I bought a second set of wheels and tires and we've had a couple of services due to the mileage. So I've spent around 2,000, 3,000 pounds or so on the maintenance side of it. But obviously it's again, it's a car about driving. I want that car to do so many miles in so many cool places and who knows what continents it might go to as well down the line. We're not even halfway through, but I was actually tempted to begin with this one. The original Schmiemobile, my 2009 
Aston Martin V8 Vantage Roadster. Now, the reason I say original Schmimobile is because I had started my channel when I owned a BMW 123D Coupe. I had also then had an Audi S5 Cabriolet before I had bought this, but this was the first time I ever introduced the car on the channel. And it was also the first time I ever spoke to a camera on a video was sitting in that seat. Now, I owned the car from November 2010 until June 2012, so almost two years. And during that time, I did about 16,000 miles down to the south of France, to Paris, all around the UK. But I made the mistake, well, not really mistake, because I kind of needed to sell it to fund the next car, but I sold it and I never heard anything more of it until around nine years later, July 2021, I got to buy it back. I got to buy back this thing. It went to an event and it's the funniest story. It went to a fairly local event in a small town south of London and the owner had put a sign in the window about the car's history a little bit. And he had said that it was owned by Tim Burton. And confusingly, there's a rather famous director called Tim Burton. And I think there was a little bit of a misunderstanding around that and somebody had seen it there and let me know about it. So I reached out to him to then reach out to the event organizers, to reach out to the owner, to ask if I could go and film a video with the car, which I did on the channel. You might have seen that. And then when I was there, it was so sentimental. And I think the owner basically saw that and was happy to move it on. And eventually, effectively, he named the price and I said, sure, let's do it. I bought it back. And we then went to McGurk, McGurk Performance Cars, Aston Martin Specialist, from whom I bought and sold my Aston Martin DBS as well. Excellent guys when it comes to these kind of cars. A lot of their team actually worked on them originally as well and know everything in and out. And we did a big, big, big job. We did almost £10,000 worth of work on it in terms of fixing any leaks or any issues because even though since I've bought it back a year and a half ago I've only driven it 700 miles it's not about that for me this isn't I don't, I don't care if I never drive it again I mean obviously love the experience but it's just the fact that I own it still that I have this car that I've owned it back and I've said a story a few times before that when I was driving away having picked it up having gone back out to obviously collect it and drive it home there's a storage pouch between the knees and the seats. And I put my hand in and found something in there. And my first thought was, oh no, I'm gonna to have to post this back, you know, minor inconvenience. But then I opened it up and it was a letter from my mother nine years prior. How crazy is that? Really, really fun and just makes it even more personal. I mean, I put that tax disc holder in the window. We stopped having those in the UK back in, I guess around 2014, 2015, something like that. But I put that there, it's still there. It's still got my French road toll tag um, bracket holder at the top of the windscreen as well. So for me, this is a story. It's a story more than any other. It's almost priceless in that respect. And it's why it has the original Shmi 150 number plate, the 87 TB. Doesn't take a genius to work out that my initials are TB. I was born in 87 and I love how symmetrical this plate is, how it looks super smart and clean. I bought that at auction many, many years ago, just before I had this car. And I put a quote from myself on there. Car spotting is not a crime. That's where it all began, really. Car spotting, filming different cars before we ended up obviously where we are today. So for me, the V8 Vantage Roadster is just a pleasant experience to go and drive to. If I ever want some nostalgia, I can take this thing out. It looks beautiful in the glacial blue paintwork, the sandstorm beige interior, the multi-spoke diamond cut silver wheels, the navy blue roof, everything about this is just, it's an era. I think it's one of the prettiest Aston Martins ever. And it's the reason I then bought the GT8 as well because of this really being for me where it began, being a Brit, lusting after an Aston Martin for the whole of my childhood, James Bond, everything about them. And these are some of the prettiest cars that they've ever made, this generation Vantage. So that's a very special one that I now own again. We're back with the third of the Black Series cars. July 2021 was a very busy month because I also bought the Mercedes-Benz C63 AMG Black Series. And what I loved about this was how different the GT Black Series, which is the ultimate track weapon, the SLS Black Series, which is the ultimate dynamic road trip car, and the C63 Black Series, which is this boisterous, slightly antisocial, menacing machine, all are, despite wearing that same brand plate. So we have, again, Again, a 60 plate with a Gottlieb Daimler quote. I kind of ran out of quotes from Gottlieb Daimler or from Carl Benz, but I bought this car for significantly less money than it's now worth. They've really shot up since. And unlike the GT Black Series, which is unlimited, 
at about 1,700 cars we think they've made in total. And the SLS Black Series, where they never officially gave a number, but it's believed to be about 350, these were limited and they made 800 of them. Now, out of the 800, not all that many have the Aero Kit. The Aero Kit is the all-exclusive option to have the carbon fiber wing mounted on the boot lid at the back and also around the front to have the carbon fiber flicks, as AMG call them around the sides as well and that for me was an absolute must now this car could do with a few things like the grill for me being returned back to the chrome that it should be and some few a few touch-ups here and there but we took it on the black series tour when we took all three of the cars that i have plus the g63 over to amg and a falter back and also visited mechatronic so it's done around 3,000 miles along the way it did come with new tires but it hasn't been the cheapest car to service i've spent about three and a half thousand pounds on it in total with a few things that it needed and it runs a little over a thousand pounds a year for the service which is quite a lot obviously counteracted against by the fact that it's appreciated since i did buy it and it's a car that i'm not sure what it will have in store in the future in my collection part of me is tempted to put in the amg bucket seats that i took out of my gtr roadster which you might remember to put them in here but then i'd also want to do the rear seat delete and turn it fully into the cage and harness setup the full track version of which there are very very few that were originally ordered who knows what happens with that in the future but certainly for now it completes that trio of the black series cars with a dream to one day perhaps purchase all six including the sl65 the clk63 and the slk55 but that would be a lot of money to put into black series cars so i'm not entirely sure whether that's realistic it's the same month again but number 11 actually on our list is the 1.2 renault clio dynamic from 2005 believe it or not all 70 something horsepower or at least 70 something horsepower when it was brand new now there's a bit of a story behind this and why this is here and why it will always in some form be around my very first car when i was a 17 year old which is the age you can start driving here in the uk was one of these in exactly this spec now you might remember that I did track down my first car in early 2020, when unfortunately it was involved in an accident. Of course, many owners after me, more than a decade and a half, I guess, after I had actually sold it on to upgrade to my BMW 1 Series way back when. But unfortunately, as a result of being in an accident and being worth less than a thousand pounds, even if it was perfect, it was written off by the insurers, scrapped and became a cube of metal. Now, this is actually how I met Tom. Tom, the car dude who works at the Museum, was via the fact that he helped me track it down and I bought it back and I own that lump of metal and one day it will be here but I decided to also buy an exact replica an identical car to what I had down to every single option this car is exactly the same same interior trim same automatic lights sunroof same options same wheels same everything as the one that I owned and roughly the same miles as well as the car that did get scrapped and even re-registered wearing the exact same number plate that I had on the car way back then s17 stands for september 17th that's my birthday and tjb as well and living the supercar dream seems very appropriate to put the tagline of the shmi 150 channel on a 1.2 clio now since buying it a year and a half ago it's driven a grand total of about 300 miles it's spent about the same on the back of low loaders because when brad and tom took it out the suspension kind of gave way on a speed bump and they got the springs replaced not particularly expensive and it's not like i'm spending thousands and thousands to restore this in the way that i did with the vantage maybe one day i would buy an absolutely perfect example to have in pristine condition but there's something about the fact that the memories it brings back for me the smells and the sound are exactly what i remember from i mean i bought that car I bought it in 2006. It was a 2005 car that had sat at the dealer lot. So I bought that car a long time ago now, which is kind of crazy to think about. Anyway, this is here. It lives here. It's part of the furniture, almost, you could say. And it was part of a very busy July 2021. We're moving now next up to the Lamborghini Huracan STO. My first ever Lamborghini, in fact. The STO being the version of the V10 baby supercar in the Lamborghini lineup with all of the learnings from the Super Trofeo 
one make race series that Lamborghinis run in. And of course they have the GT3s as well, but this takes the V10, makes it loud, makes it brazen, makes it in your face. My first Lambo ever. And in fact, I bought the car from Lamborghini Pangborn and took delivery in October, 2021. So I've owned it for about 15 months at this point after talking with Craig there for so many years about one day buying a Lambo from him. Since then, it's done around 4,600 or so miles in total, coming up to 5,000. It's had a one-year annual service, but you actually get with these a four-year service plan. So you don't have to pay anything for the services over the first couple of years. It happened to be at the dealership anyway, because I was at the time actually trying to sell the car, decided not to, brought it back to the garage, took it out to show Richard Hammond. Absolutely hilarious. I'm not gonna lie, so incredibly funny. But the thing with a car like this is that despite looking ludicrous, snorkel up top, a wing like this at the back and the sound it makes, it's actually quite drivable. It's quite comfortable. And I took it all the way down to Italy. This has been down to the Lamborghini factory in Santa Gata Bolognese to go and see the build process to visit the factory itself. It's been booted off the Nürburgring for being a little bit too loud and it's currently absolutely filthy and in dire need of a cleanup. Of course, the colors of this particular car are quite a talking point. The colors of a lot of these cars are talking points. I know, I like bright and bold. Throughout the entirety of my life, I've always been drawn to things that are colorful, to things that stand out. It's just the way it is, whether it's watches or clothes or anything. Colour is the thing for me and this particular shade, Viola Bast as it's called, that comes from the Ad Personum palette is wonderful. Now at the time I ordered this car there was a bit of a challenge in terms of options. For example, you couldn't have all of a painted contrast and the exposed carbon fiber and a few other things. You had to basically only have a couple of options due to the limitations of supply. I wanted to have satin carbon, the dry carbon, absolute must. So underneath the vinyl giallo accents, the yellow is all vinyl. It can all come off. The snorkel is actually carbon fiber. This is all satin black underneath. So it can be, as it was when I took delivery, just the magenta and black as opposed to the contrast of the yellow. But to me, the whole thing with a car like this is that it's so in your face, you might as well play with it. Why be secretive? Why order it in something that doesn't stand out when it's got this picnic table on the back of it? I mean, quite a few of the cars in my collection do, and there are quite a few of them that are themed from motorsport. And I've enjoyed driving it. I feel it's not the fastest. The STO is nowhere nearly as quick, even to be honest, as the 675 LT Spider. I've owned that obviously for five years longer, but I think that car on a straight line is faster. I suspect on a track, it's probably faster to be completely honest, but it doesn't have the drama of this. If you pull up somewhere with this car, if you take this to, even if you're just in a petrol station, a gas station with this thing, there's nothing that draws the attention in the way this car does. It's hilarious. It's not really me. It's not me. That's probably why I've gone so far the other way with it. You know, a spec of a car for me is more akin to my SF90 that we're going to get to shortly, or the Lusso, for example. This was just, uh, why not? Why not go mad with it? I was actually in Miami at the time I spec'd it. No, I wasn't smoking anything, but I was certainly, let's do it. Let's just give it a go, why not? So the STO, I think, is now gonna be around for quite a while, and I'm gonna enjoy it a whole lot more. This year in particular is Lamborghini's 60th anniversary. They found it back in 1963. There are gonna to be tons of events, runs, drives, and rallies, and I think there could be some fun things to do with this as well. Another absentee that arrived almost exactly a year ago is my Williams FW19 Formula One show car. Now, at the time, it was a bit of a leap of faith because I didn't really know what I was going to be in store for, but it's show car chassis one. It had been used as a racing simulator wrapped up in a livery, and I was completely clueless about how cool what we had underneath actually was. As a result, it spent a lot of the time since going through a restoration. That means a repaint at Godlimans to transform it back to period correct Rothman's livery and also extensive work at TDF. They've been stripping it down, replacing lots of parts, basically finding a balance between creating something that will look mega with something that's not necessarily spending all of the money in the world. So I'm a little over 10,000 pounds or so into the restoration work you could say over the last year, but ultimately this is something worth many multiples of that. So it's worth 
doing the right thing with it, if we could say. It's show car number one. I want it to look mega. No, it can never be a running car for those of you who are wondering because it doesn't have a full tub with the strength of, that you would need for a race car. It was built as a show car, but using the original molds. So it's a car that's been through many different liveries, probably been on display at loads of different events, used by different sponsors, for example, and will find itself a home here at the Museum when it's completed in not all that long. To the other end of the garage and the first of the cars that would normally be found in red. We have my Ferrari GTC4 Lusso, the V12 in blue Potsy, which I bought in February 2022. So I've owned it for just shy of 12 months, driven it a lot, seven and a half thousand miles in total, which for one of these in under a year is a whole lot, believe me. Now, I used to own a Lusso. I'd had an FF before that. So I actually still had a spare set of wheels with winter tires that I had had from my previous car. So those are now on it. We've done the swap over just for winter, but I bought this car kind of on a whim when I saw the spec. The colors, this navy blue with that interior, for me especially with the SF90 that was on order at the time to be delivered quite soon thereafter. And I love this format, this shape. It's very Marmite for a lot of people, this bread van shooting brake style, two door. Obviously we now have the Pura Sangue, which will be joining my collection in a year or two, but this is such a cool thing to drive. 6.3 liter NA V12 that sounds totally wonderful. Doors that are slightly awkward, I'm not gonna lie, but just to stand here and start this for a moment, and I probably should have started the STO, but we'll have to deal with 12 cylinders for the moment. Have a listen to this. It's silly. Factory exhaust. Novatec Switchtronic, which is the valve to open it up. The rumble of this, the rawness of this. Maybe I should turn it off. Gosh, that's so loud. That is so, so loud. Now, in terms of maintenance, I think it had a service, but Ferraris have a seven year service plan. So even this car, which is it's coming up six years old, believe it or not, it's a 2017 car, May 17, I think, um, still has some free servicing, has two years warranty because I obviously bought it from HRO and Ferrari in London. I did have to pay for road tax, but I also had this repainted, this insert on the front grille, um, which you can't PPF because it's satin. Well, you could technically, but a little bit complicated with the way it's made and the shapes. So I had this done to make it look much tidier and had the PPF redone at the front end as well to make it look immaculate after we had a big road trip with it, did many miles and it got a little bit battered because I think there's a balance between using a car a lot and having a lot of fun with it. This was the ultimate support wagon for the SF90, but keeping it looking wonderful at the other end of the spectrum as well. Now, as well as not starting the STO, I didn't mention the plate on the STO. So what I might do here is very quickly, this one, 63, which used to be on my G63, is now on a car that is equipped with a 6.3 liter NA V12 with the aerodynamics of a people who don't build engines quote from Enzo Ferrari. So let me just do a very quick key swap. We'll pop the Lusso key back in my Lego key cabinet, grab the STO key and come and focus on the plate up here, which you might've noticed is not actually on the front of the car at all right now, because I need to reinstall the plate bracket. When I put it for sale at the dealership, obviously first thing any Lambo customer will want is to remove their plate plinth, but I like to have them because then be the rules. So it needs to be reattached, reinstalled under here. But the plate is SH10 MEE. We have a V10 engine. I had to try something new by Ferruccio Lamborghini. Now, of course, this was trying something new for me in the first place to purchase a Hurricane STO. So I feel like that's pretty suitable for it. And I well, know I do need to swing in here. It sounds on a cold start like this. Maybe we'll give that a break for the moment. <laughs> you get the point. Right, let's see what's next. From some Italian cars to another Italian car and probably my car of the moment, I'm driving it all of the time, the Ferrari SF90 Stradale. It's absolutely filthy because I've taken it out in horrible weather as I have with the STO as well. But the spec of this is, if I can say so myself, 
gorgeous. This is, this is me in a car spec. This blue Electrico paint with the interior, which we're going to take a proper look at in just a moment as well, in the dual tone Sabia and blue Sterling. Now, the SF90, I actually bought officially in March last year, so I've owned it for about 10 months or so at this point, driven it just shy of 5,000 miles, and it's soon to be embarking on a trip to the mountains as well, given I have fitted it with winter tyres, and I also have a roof box currently being painted in this colour to go on the top. It is a car that I enjoy driving so much in a garage filled with very track focused cars. This still has a soft setup. It rides beautifully. The clue is in the name, as I often say, SF90 Stradale. Stradale literally means from Italian road. It is a very comfortable thing. It's a hybrid, a thousand horsepower. It is brutally fast. When you drive it flat out on the Autobahn, you have no idea. It's a bit heavy and floaty as a result for the Nürburgring. You could spec it with what they call the Assetto Fiorano, the Fiorano track package with a stiffer set of dampers, but then you can't have the lift system, which takes away from the usability and I love using it. So for me, that wouldn't necessarily make sense as I use it at the moment. I do very much enjoy driving it in electric mode. It's plugged in at the moment, charging up. You get about 15 miles, 25 kilometers of electric range. So genuinely, this is my daily at the moment. This is the car that I drive by default, if I'm just driving home from here at the garage or just off for something not necessarily too far away. So I intend to do many, many more miles with it. Again, it has the seven year um, full package, four years warranty, seven years of servicing. So nothing to worry about. It hasn't had anything yet other than a fair few trips to the dealer, I have to be honest, for some issues, small little gremlins, usually sensors, electrical things, really silly stuff, really annoying, silly stuff that's meant it's had to go in, but hopefully doing more miles, it gets through more of those and we have fewer issues down the line. Like I say, lots of miles started actually in Italy, started from Enzo Ferrari's house at Fiorano in Marinello, which was really, really special. Now, let me come and show you the inside of this because for me, that's a big part of it. And I'll connect this to something that kind of irritates me about this car, but keyless open up, it's not gonna hit the lift. We've checked that in advance. And inside there you have this lovely spec and we spend a lot of time working on this the wrap around sabia carpets that go underneath you and up through the armrest the blue inserts that you have in the seat the blue steering wheel blue dashboard blue headliner all of the different details it's such a nice place to be sat inside there it's genuinely lovely it feels like such a premium quality car now one of the things that bugs me about it is once you've closed it there is no way to stop an SF90 from auto locking. If you want it to stay open, it won't. It will lock itself. Even in the settings, there's nothing. You can't do it. You can turn off, see, automatic. So if there was a passenger still sat in the car, it would have just locked and now they would move and the alarm would go off. It's a funny thing about the car, but hey, small little niggles. Anyway, I want to show you this number plate. Clutching at straws on the 20, I'm not gonna lie, but if you can dream it, you can do it, Enzo Ferrari. I've always felt if you can dream it, work very hard at it, you can do it. And this was my first ever brand new Ferrari, the first Ferrari I ever spec from you myself. And therefore it feels very, very personal. The 20, like I say, SF90 launched as a model year 2020. It has two powertrains. It has 220 electric horsepower, kind of a few little links, but you can't have 90 before anybody asks, that's not possible. The 90 registration here in the UK can't go on a car that is registered before, let me get this right, is it the 1st of September 2040? Is that right? Yes, that's right. So I'm not waiting till 2040 to register this in 17 years time that would be no fun at all in any world. So hence 20, SH20 MEE will do for now. This has been a big, big project, particularly on the Museum channel, my Renault Clio V6, a 2004 car, effectively the flagship car of what was my first car. This at the time was the ultimate. They put a 2.9 litre V6 
in the back of a hatchback. It's rear driven, six speed manual, 255 horsepower. This particular car I bought in May, 2022. So I've owned it for seven or eight months, but it's been a big project. The car was in a state. I actually bought it from North America at the start of Gumball, dealing with all of the calls and the banking from across the world was a massive pain. It was a black gold car, one of the original UK 384 cars, but it was damaged on every panel. It hadn't been started for years. There was a mouse living in the back of it. It had cracked lights. It had just a complete overload of work that was needed. So this has been a year of spending a lot of money on doing this up. I think something in the region of 17,000 pounds or so has gone into it, which is what you could actually buy a good one of these for a few years ago, which is crazy to think. A good one of these now is gonna cost you the best part of 80,000 pounds, 90,000 pounds, a really, really low mileage mint one would probably run you over 100,000 pounds for a 20 year old Renault Clio. It's madness, but they only made about 1,300 of them in total. It's a lot of fun to drive, even if it's a bit silly. And this particular car has had so much work done. The respray to acid yellow by Godlimans, all of the mechanical work with Scott at SG Motorsport, tons of upgrades here, there, everywhere, suspension, brakes, interior details. In fact, let's come and have a quick little look at some of the things on the inside of this. We can squeeze on through and come and check this out through here and I'll show you what we've got. There are a few th more things that I would like to do with it, but inside here, we've got the interior painted to match. We had dub trim do the Alcantara for the steering wheel with the stitching. Seat belts obviously in the same color as well. I think it would go well with some bucket seats. So maybe that's what will cap happen down the line with this as we squeeze in underneath the lifts. But it's a cool thing. I love driving it. I absolutely love driving it so far, having a lot of fun. Now, in terms of the plate, you notice this one's a little bit different. There's a reason it's a little bit different. So I've gone for V6 FTA. Yes, it's a little bit cliche having V6 on the Clio V6, but a lot of people do. FTA is actually a nod back to my original Renault Clio. When I had bought that car, before I put S17 TJB on it, it was registered as LR, which is a London registration, 05, it was in 2005, FTA. So this is a bit of a personal one for me. I figured I would go with that. I think it connects quite nicely. And the quote at the bottom, you start with a practical, sensible family hatchback, then fill it full of engine, Jeremy Clarkson. Bit of a quote from the Top Gear episode where Clarkson drove this thing. And I suppose that for me was part of why there's one here now, because it was all setting the scenes for one of these. And I think it fits very nicely into this category of cars that's well, growing in value a lot at the moment, because people like me have got a little bit older, could only dream of one of these back at the time, and now find themselves able to purchase one and knowing that we'll never have things like this again makes it even more appealing. The fact that nobody's gonna stick a mid-engine V6 in a hatchback ever again, that, that will not happen. There are very few of them that ever existed and I'm very happy to have one of them in my collection. We get to the biggest of the big ones with a very nice key as well, the Zenvo TSRS. The Zenvo, my first proper, proper hypercar. I know for many, the Senna is a hypercar, but this is by every definition a hypercar. I've driven it about 750 miles so far, which is about the same amount that I've driven the Clio V6 as well. I took delivery at the factory in Denmark in August of last year. So I've owned it for only about four or five months. We then had it transported down to Croatia to join the most fabulous of events, the Supercar Owners Circle Hypercar Rally in Croatia. Driving in here on one of the first couple of days I've driven the car chasing the Bugatti La Voiture Noir amongst other hypercars. Absolutely unreal for me because this is already so extreme. I don't, I don't really know how to get my head around it. It's the 14th Zenvo chassis, hence the plate, as you might've figured. The SH14 MEE, it's the fourth TSRS, so that fits quite nicely. And this, there's a special quote down here. Though this be madness, yet there is method in it by William Shakespeare, a quote from Hamlet, which is of course a play set in Denmark. Very suitable for my one of Thor's hammers, quite literally with the shape of this key. So the TSRS is the ultimate rendition of the TS series Zenvo models. Um, only 10 of them in total. Like I say, this is number four. They've also, out of those 10, got a split between the S, which has the 
crazy wing as it's often known and the gts which has a more integrated spoiler in the deck lid but the big thing with the zentripetal wing is how it pivots from side to side and dances around so when you're turning it goes up on the inside to give you more downforce to help you turn even more tightly which scientifically increases your cornering speeds by something like two percent which given there's a negligible weight impact for the hydraulics means that you have a little bit more performance and a little bit faster lap times but to be honest it's not really about that for me it's about the story and about how silly it is because you don't buy a car like this because you need it or because of anything like that you buy a car like this because you want it and because it's your heart just says do you know what why not and it beats fast and even thinking about it if you put e85 in this thing you have 1360 horsepower think about that that's three and a half times the Lotus Amira. That is, well, literally five times the Clio V6. Mind boggling. And it's carbon, carbon, carbon everywhere. I mean, just look at this thing. Come and look at the details, the carbon weave that you have with this purple tint over the bonnet. I created all of these colors, the bright lime gron for the pinstripe, this lila perlamore, which means mother of pearl purple for the main body color. If we actually just pop it open because the whole thing's worth looking at. In fact, there's a bit of a process behind it. The interior, again, totally bespoke. All of the quilting, the dual tone that you see everywhere, the green diamonds or sorry, hexagonal shapes that all tie into the design that you see around the car, the anodized sections. As we come around towards the back, the process to open this, by the way, you have these pushers that slide out, one on each side to make sure it's done safely. I say this, and I've literally got the key in my hand. I'm gonna safely put that in my pocket because I do not want to damage it. It is so lovely. But this, it's quite cold. There we go, pops out. You then lean the wing back. You can then put these back in, should you wish to make sure it stays safely back there, which we absolutely do right now. Then I come round because behind the seat is a button. And upon pressing this button, I can just figure out where exactly that is. Brain block, there it is. Boom, up goes the entire rear clam to reveal a world of carbon. Back there, the mid-engine 5.8 liter supercharged V8, which like I say, puts out so much power, it makes very little sense. F1 technology in the engine, so much clever engineering and tech in this and just such a bespoke car the way it's built the way it's engineered the way it's created the team behind it and it's been such a cool story to have seen it being built at the factory to have done the road to zenvo series to head out there to be part of all of that i have enjoyed it so much it's more even than just the car itself it's the whole experience and the events and the doors and opportunities of owning a car like this because you can go to a exclusive car event with a car like the Senna or the SF90 but I can guarantee there'll be another one you go there with the Zenvo and unless it's a Zenvo event you're probably not going to see another one around and if you do they're probably somebody you know because it's such a small little community anyway make sure there we go that's clicked in make sure it's sealed properly so this for me has been a completely different world as I failed to close the door properly it's it's mind-boggling it's it's almost intimidating so not many miles driven yet I need to make sure that the miles I drive with it are special miles significant miles relevant miles I'm not going to drive it in our horrible wintry grimy weather dirty roads with this much power to the back let's play it safe until I'm a bit more confident and comfortable with it. Respect the car or it can go wrong very quickly. The most recent purchase, the Lotus Emira first edition. The Emira has been hugely hyped. It's actually the first Lotus that I've ever owned, despite the fact we do have a few other here that we'll talk about in a moment as well. I have the 13 plate on here because the original code name for the car was actually type 131. So it seemed quite suitable to have 131. This is the factory plate. I haven't changed it yet to my own, which I have a quote from Colin Chapman about 
everything that's really gone into this, simplify and then add lightness, the history or motto, you could say, of Lotus. And this is actually surprisingly light. It builds on the previous models, the Elise, the uh, Evora and the Exige. You've got a 3.5 litre supercharged V6. Mine is the manual. You can have a manual or an auto. There will be the AMG version as well with the two litre turbo four cylinder with the dual clutch. But it's a car that for me is very dailyable perhaps not in bright Hethel yellow. I've only driven about 412 miles, I think it's gone on the clock so far. It's got front end protection from Topaz. So many of the cars have Topaz PPF because it keeps them looking as beautiful as you see them here in the garage. And then I've gone for that ice gray interior, which is quite an out there choice for choosing the sport specification for the suspension and damping. But I think it looks so nice. I really, really like the look of this thing. I think it punches so far above its weight. And my first experience of the Amira was actually hopping on board one, being driven by none other than Jensen Button up the Goodwood Festival of Speed hill climb. So a good way to jump in at the deep end with it. I'm not sure what the longevity will be, whether I'll have the car for one year, two years, three years, five years, 10 years, don't know at this stage at all, but certainly very much enjoying the early mileage with it. It's a car that's really, not very Lotus-like. You have wireless connection from your phone to Android Auto. You have cup holders, you have practicality, you have storage space. There's room behind the seats, there's room at the back. No room up at the front, as I showed in my full induction tour. Things like having a really pretty nice key, to be completely honest, just add to the experience. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And I think Lotus have absolutely hit a home run with the Amira. And I'm glad I put down my order before it was ever even shown. I placed the deposit more than two years ago, a long time ago, a long, long time ago, before they had even shown the spy, not the spy shots, the studio shots of the car was when I ordered it. Um, and yeah, generally really enjoy it, even though I'm only one month in. So there's going to be a lot more to come with that down the line, obviously. But yeah, Lotus and Mira. It's a good car to buy. Let's move on to the other cars that are here at the Schmuseum that I've not mentioned yet, and that's because they are not mine. Either friends cars that are here for storage or perhaps fleet cars that we're running as well. And I want to start again in chronological order with the one of those to arrive the longest to go back in May, a car that I actually collected and have been sharing with you on the channel, the Lotus Elise Cup 250 Final Edition that belongs to a friend of mine. Now it's not just a Cup 250 Final Edition, it is the final one to have rolled off the production line, hence the very suitable and very valuable number plate that it wears, the word final. Not only that though, the paint colour, RAL 2005 Luminous Orange, a 14 layer paint that is so bright when you've been looking at it, it makes any other colour seem muted, dark and dirty, but it's a colour that will fade over time, almost a patina. And this particular car, despite only being eight months or so old, has actually already done 11,000 miles. The owner has allowed many of his friends to drive it. It's been on lots of tours around Europe, particularly in the sunshine. And if you compare this with the original paint color, you can actually see how much it's faded already. But it's a very, very valuable thing and amazing to see it being driven. And I cannot say thank you enough for the opportunity to drive, enjoy, and to share that with you. Now, shortly after that arrived, we also were greeted by something completely different, the Jaguar XJ220S. Now this belongs to Max Cooper, the founder of Gumball 3000. And before I was involved in doing the rallies myself, I used to watch and idolize this car on the rally. So having it here for me is mind bogglingly cool. They made nine XJ220Ss in total six of them originally, and then three XJ220s were later converted, but still back in the 90s. It weighs less than 1,100 kilos and has 700 horsepower, but it's huge. This thing is longer than even the Ford GT or any of the other cars that are here. It's so cool though. I don't know how long it's going to be around for. It's been here for six months, but I'm not complaining because I love looking at it. It's awesome to have it here. We just kind of leave it parked up in this corner of the garage, but hey, I'm not complaining. Now we also have up top here, also belonging to the owner of Final, we have first, that number plate, epic. This is a Lotus Elise S1 Sport 190 with a full carbon fiber body. It sounds amazing. The way it revs up is glorious. I've not actually taken it out for a drive, just kind of look after it as part of this pairing of first and final together that we have here 
which is again just really cool. So we also have a couple of team cars that we use at the Museum. We have a Transit Custom MSRT from Ford that we're running as well as a bit of a practical usable van. Some news on that as well to come soon. Plus we have a Skoda Octavia VRS long-term car that mostly is being driven around by Brad but occasionally we jump in it to go out to different things as well. We took it for the collection day of the Lotus Emira in fact when we went over to Hethel. Plus Behind me, this is the TVR T350, sorry, that belongs to my friends at Dub Customs. It's actually probably appeared on the channel over the years so many times when I've been at Dub Customs workshop. Normally it's been kept there. They've asked me if I can look after it for a while. So it's been chilling, sitting pretty here also. Plus, one more I need to mention, the Ubath 124, which belongs to Brad, who works here at the Museum as well. That's been kind of resident a little bit over winter while well, he's mostly been running some of the team cars and other cars that he has access to as well. And it looks kind of cool sitting underneath the slightly slouching Clio due to collapsed suspension and flat tires, unfortunately. So have I named them all? Have I got them all there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One more slightly complicated car you could say the amg gtr roadster i still at this moment in time do actually own my amg gtr roadster i've had for a couple of years it's been for sale for a while but it's not yet moved on despite being in my opinion a lovely specification in hyacinth thread i drove around seven or eight thousand miles with it have owned it for about two years fairly minimal cost not particularly expensive to service those things i put in the bucket seats but took them out and returned it back to standard specification at the end as well so that's it for the visiting cars Let's talk about future cars for a moment. So down the line, I've mentioned a Morgan Super 3. I'm not entirely sure on my plans for the Morgan Super 3. I haven't confirmed spec and order and that kind of thing because to be honest, I'm not entirely ready for it and have to work out what I'll do with it. I have also mentioned two new Ferraris to join the growing Ferrari part of the collection, both the 296 GTS, which will be spec soon and should be delivered, I believe, in Q1 2024. So a fair while away still, 12 months from now. And also the Pura Sangue, the FUV, the SUV, which will be probably later end of 2024. So a long time before that's going to be spec at all. But there we go, pretty much a full garage update, a full tour of the car collection, as we have more cars here than have ever been in one place at one time. Only two absentees at the moment, the GT Black Series in the USA, the Formula One show car being finished up as well, both of which could be back at some point before too long. And who knows, maybe we have a full house. I don't have any other cars really that are ordered or due this year. Some letters of intent and kind of expressions of interest in cars that haven't been released. So it's probably going to be a year where we focus more on projects, things like the Clio V6, as I've spoken about so much recently, listing off some of the different cars that I'm interested in acquiring. I've got a dream list of around 15 or so cars now, things that I would like to add or bring into the collection. But I hope this has been an overall update run through for you. If you're new here, as I said, welcome and thank you for joining. I hope it's been interesting to find out about some of the cars, some of the costs behind some of the cars as well, because I find it super intriguing sometimes to compare and see how they stack up. And you know, something like the SLS Black Series that's cost me a small fortune in terms of the work that it's needed, is all countered by the fact that the car is also worth an even bigger fortune, luckily, along the way. That turned out to be a decision that at the time was very nerve wracking, but now is actually quite positive, we could say. So this has been it, the full tour of the Shmi 150 car collection, all of the cars in detail. So thank you very much for watching. Thank you for being subscribed. Thank you to everyone who's been part of the journey because getting here has been a 13 year adventure, creating videos on average more than once per day, more videos uploaded than days since my first video back in January, 2010. It's nonstop, it's a lot of fun, and it's seriously enjoyable to be able to share the experiences of these cars and to bring you along for the journey and to be part of it all, to see what it's like, whether it's running a car like the Zenvo, building up a project like the Clio V6 or anything else in between them all and everything else that's around. So thank you very much for watching as always, guys. I appreciate your support an awful lot, but that is it for this time and I'll see you again very soon. Cheers.